Welcome enthusiasts of St. Thomas, and those of you who are simply lost on YouTube. Um, it's my great pleasure to be with you during this odd hour, um, or whenever you decide to turn me off, um, which is now your much coveted but cruel right. There will be um, severe temptations uh, to do this, but I ask you to manfully resist. Um, and if people are falling away, I ask Father Dominic to change the blue screen into an image of San Francisco. We'll try to keep the show interesting for you. Um, the Dominican Institute has gone to great lengths um, to make this uh, live interactive uh, experience something special. And so to gratuitously uh, work against that and offer an artificial archival quality and disengaged character to this talk, I will read it. Can a plague have any meaning? Or is it just a thing that happens? Is it just a part of blind nature, entirely exhausted by nature's horizon? The question would in this case be something like asking why bat, pig, or other animal populations suffer their own lethal epidemics. Certainly not for their sins. The first cats have now tested positive for COVID-19. Shall we blame this on their decadent Western materialism and abandonment of the Christian religion? Or there's a live studio audience here that has been instructed uh, not to laugh even when I'm very funny. Over the weekend, several major world newspapers intensified their reporting on the problem that Christian belief in its malign fantasies poses for society at this difficult moment. On Friday, an op-ed in the New York Times pulled out the inevitable faith versus science canard. Quote, the religious rights hostility to science is crippling our response to the coronavirus, we are told. In France, a worried article about religious extremists profiteering on the crisis bore the title Apocalypse, Divine Punition, when the coronavirus confirms the prophecies of fundamentalists and sectarians. Now, over the weekend, I confess that I had the awkward task of answering an email asking me whether I thought this plague was a commencement of the beginning of Revelation's 1260 days. This lecture will not be my answer to that question. It will, however, attempt to address the question of the pandemic's meaning, if it has one, by placing this quite extraordinary event in a certain biblical perspective, hopefully helping a bit to locate where we suddenly stand. I will take a broad humanistic approach. Still, cultural elites will find our exercise a worrisome regression to the ignorant mythopoeic piety of the Middle Ages. To them, I will only say this. It is actually Bronze Age piety. Additionally, materialism is a cultural scourge in a twofold sense, both philosophical and moral. If we are blind as the bats who caused uh, all of this to the moral meaning uh, of our gripping moment, our materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is as much of a problem as our unrestrained sensuality and consumption. So let us begin. And pardon me uh, if we begin by smoking cigarettes in a French cafe. Uh, it was here that the autopsy was pronounced over the vision uh, of biblical plagues. The plague is not a modern way to die. This expression of Dr. Rieu in Albert Camus' novel, The Plague, wonderfully captures a modern experience of alienation and smugness. Death by smallpox or by Viking raid is also not a modern way to die. But with the plague, there is more Judeo-Christian legitimacy on the line, which is clearly why Camus chose this freighted subject. The plague carries with it great outbreaks of neurotic guilt and spasms of otherworldly fixation. Calamity has fallen upon you, my brothers, and my brothers, you deserved it. So bellows Father Panelu, the fictional foil of the young atheist Dr. Ryu, as the old priest mounts the pulpit, to address the eerie return of bubonic plague to modern Algiers. Camus' father, Panelou, is a caricature who opposes medicine and faith and seeks in vain with his sermons to raise up latter-day flagellants. Still, his failure to find them seems quite probable, however improbable his character may be. Modern man has exchanged apocalyptic for absurdity. This is what Camus tells us. Plagues might happen, but they have no meaning. The only thing to do is strenuously push back, vigorously resist the unwanted surge of death pouring into life, moved by a pointless but strong desire to keep on living. 
Sisyphus uh, is the famous image for this pushback. The alternative to accepting this absurd situation is either to give in to death, Camus said suicide was the only real philosophical question, or else to accept a promise of hope. The choice for meaning is in this way the choice between a tragic or a comic end. For meaning is about asking why, not the efficient empirical why, uh, the why on the order of bats, wet markets, and person-to-person -person contacts, but rather the final why, the why that seeks to know the end of the story. The advance of legalized suicide in our culture shows clearly enough that the attraction of despair uh, and supreme discontent felt by many who look death in the eye with less existentialist heroism than a raw embrace of the absurd. As for hope, the promise today comes in two contrasting forms. On the one hand, we have the transhumanist party proposing an ubermensch eschatology of we shall overcome. With enough Google, Amazon, and Facebook in our lives, we shall design smart cities and a smart global village and attain a kind of Gnostic green heaven on Earth, or maybe on Mars or the Moon. On the other hand, we have Four Father Panelu, uh, whose musty old biblical promise of eschatological hope is invested in society's repentance, which, in its otherworldly gaze, looks suspiciously like a surrender to death. The Christian, that is the biblical view, is thus made out to look like a rambling, the rambling of a confused old man who has unaccountably mistaken guilt for germs. Now the obscene folly of misplaced guilt trips becomes visible with this little exercise. Imagine Father Panelou's Jeremiads as bedside manners at Bergamo uh, at this very moment. Is a moralizing tongue lashing really what is missing from these scenes of immense distress? as pious old Italian women die with rosaries in their hands, attended by frazzled atheist doctors and hospitals filled to cracking, it hardly seems like the ideal moment to preach. As a society, can we really afford to pause and ask questions when people are dying in triage? In response to this rebuff, I would offer as a provocation that COVID-19 is itself the immense distraction. I do not mean, though it would certainly also be true, that it is an immense distraction from the broad business of living. I mean that if all our concentration is lost right now, as it is, upon a spherical single strain RNA virus, this protein molecule with its lipid envelope studded with club-shaped projections, we will have missed the awful moment of our visitation. For it is death, with a giant capital D, that stands behind this new pestilential apparition. COVID-19 is just death's passing avatar. This is at least what Camus saw in the return of the plague in his novel, and what the scriptures would also have us see in this moment of crisis. In the sixth chapter of John's Apocalypse, plague appears on the scene as the rider on the pale green horse emerges. The rider's name is given. His name is Thanatos death. He is the only one of the four horsemen of Revelation to be bear a name. Death is given authority over a quarter of the earth, and he works in tandem with the earlier red and black riders. The rider on the blood red horse carried a sword to take away peace from the earth. The rider on the black horse bore a pair of scales to measure the gravity of the terrible famine. Pale green death, the sickly color of illness, carries no token, but he has Hades in his train. Hades, of course, is Greek for the Hebrew Sheol. Now, Sheol, we must know, is not just a place where dead shadows go to eternally linger. No, Sheol, we must know, uh, in the Bible, is also a dark force that slithers out uh, of its hold like smoke to wrap its tentacles around our lives and drag us down into the pit. Sheol is death's long arm that seizes upon us, even in life, with symptoms like distress solitude and sickness, all harbingers of death's arrival. With this equipment, the final pale green rider has the mission to complete the work of the earlier horsemen. He is specifically sent forth to kill with sword, famine, plague, and with wild beasts. So, biblical plagues are not a self-standing theme. The apparition of a plague belongs in the first place to a larger cluster of ideas, all summarized and personified by death and Sheol.
Sword, famine, and plague, in fact, is a stereotyped prophetic triad, with its roots in the conventional evils of war. We're not talking then about the death of him or her, of this or that individual, like the angel of death who was sent to tell the patriarch Abraham his time had come in extra-biblical traditions. The scope of death, as signified by these threefold killers of war, implies instead that the threat is the extinction of entire nations and peoples. Faced with the Babylonian menace to Israel's very survival, Jeremiah thus uses the triple cluster multiple times to sum up the fate awaiting those who will not listen to the prophet's urgent message. Whoever stays in the city will die by sword, famine, and plague. Ezekiel, faced with the same siege, takes the same concatenation of evils and divvies up the people's fate neatly in thirds, throwing in dispersion in exile for good measure. One third of you shall die by plague or be consumed by famine. One third shall fall to the sword around you, and one third I will scatter to every wind. Together, these three coordinate fates, sword, famine, and plague, the red, black, and the sickly green horses, mean to capture the distress of every mortal confrontation that a society as a society can face with death. Peoples die through violence, but they die by nature and they die by raging sickness. In a disturbing text in 2 Samuel 24, David must choose between these three terrible options. Shall three years of famine come to you on your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now consider and decide what answer I shall return to the one who sent me. Then David said to Gad, I am in great distress. Let us fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great, but let me not fall into human hands. Here we have the conversion rates for our three woes, and we find that a single day of plague is worth a month of war and a whole year of famine. The ratios are meant as a measure of just how fast men fall when a truly grave contagion comes upon them. By now we have all heard that more people died in the Spanish flu a bewildering 500 million worldwide than the merely 20 million in the four years of mechanized mass slaughter in World War I. The plague comes directly from God's hand, moreover, with a swift and sightless onset uh, where death has less bulky moving, moving parts and mediators. Plague accordingly possesses a certain numinous primordial terror in a word, it is a more powerful and raw encounter with bodily death itself. In this way, plague is also a more immediate encounter with the one who alone gives both life and death, both grace and mercy. In the Bible, the sin-plague nexus is finally much stronger than the corresponding connection between sins and wars, or between sins and famine, both of which appear often in the scriptures uh, with no connection uh, to anyone's sin. In comparison, the human dimension of the sword is clear, but famine, which seems to be an eco-apocalypse, requires comment. On the one hand, famine is the artificial effect and the entire objective of siege warfare, that is, the work of man. The Black Rider scales might also hold a key. They are the sign of ancient commerce, and it is not hunger per se, but what we, call, what we might call system collapse that the writer flaunts, a quart of wheat for a day's wages and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. Profiteering walks together with the failure in production, and David prefers, in the end, to roll his dice with the mercy of God. He gambles rightly for those who know the story. In Revelation 6, the surprise addition of wild animals to death's traditional prophetic triad adds one important final note. The illusion here is twofold. First, we have an echo of the wild beasts of Daniel's vision, namely an apocalyptic symbol for the reigning world powers. I mentioned above transhumanist eschatology with its utopian hope in human systems. For the Bible, these impostors are only one more ugly, destructive agent of death. The other illusion is more subtle, but also in a way more sure. It carries us directly back to a passage at the end of the Pentateuch. Moses' last discourse in Deuteronomy 32. The text tells a prophetic history of the chosen people and finally moves us from the dramatis personae to the story wherein we find them. The story goes like this. After the Lord finds and nourishes Jacob and chooses him for himself, Jacob grows fat and forgets the Lord who blessed him. So the Lord turns with blazing anger against his very own people, throwing against them the full ar arsenal of his maledictions. Thus, by my wrath, 
a fire is enkindled that shall rage to the depths, wasting hunger and consuming fever and bitter plague. The fangs of wild beasts I will send against them. Snatched away by the sword in the street and by sheer terror at home, I thought to scatter them and blot out the memory of them forever. Biblical examples of sin sparking angry plagues come a dime a dozen. In Exodus 32, after the episode of the golden calf, God sends a plague upon the people. In the desert, when the people complain and want to change in menu, quote, the Lord heard it and his anger was kindled. In response, the mysterious fire of the Lord burns against them, charring the edges of the camp until Moses calms it. Now, however, things go from bad to worse, for when the Israelites grumble anew, God this time gets very angry by Yichar Afaronai Ma'ud, and he strikes them hard with a very great plague. In number 16, when the people rebel against Moses and Aaron, guess what happens? 14,700 die in a plague. One starts to wonder who is bound to get wise sooner. Israel keeps sinning, and the Lord keeps trying the same uh, uh, punitive deterrent. Perhaps it was all, in fact, just a matter of more soap and running water. Now, we live after Moses in an after-virtue kind of way. Between here and there, between the Bible and our present pandemic, between the pre- and the post-Christian worlds, stands a great deal of both real and pretended enlightenment. The profound Greek journey from myths to the love of wisdom, that Greek wisdom wed to the revelation of Israel's Bible's Christian God, that Judeo-Grecian Christian God's late eclipse, as a fading postulate of practical reason and his present prolonged exorcism from human thought and action, between all our real advances in medicine and our dazzling progress in natural science, and between the worrisome ebbs and flows in our religion, the ancient, self-evident equation, plague equals divine wrath, has become for us a dubious, offensive, and unintelligible manner of thinking. The equation might be uh, exposed as out of fashion in any number of ways. The German bishops recently released a statement addressing the corona crisis, which will do quite well. Quote, God is a friend of life, the document confesses. As Christians, we are of the firm conviction sickness is not a divine punishment. Sickness belongs to our human nature as vulnerable and fragile beings. The fact that Hans Kung has evidently gone on record linking the pandemic to the revenge of Gaia for mankind's sins against the earth must, I suppose, be reckoned as a neo-paleo theological thesis beyond even the German bishop's normal mischief. One would have thought that Pachamama had been adequately placated. An impassioned sermon censuring all theological contempt of science was recently aired on a popular German science show. Quote, the coronavirus is a scientific matter of fact, eine wissenschaftliche Tatsache. It is not the wrath of God or the revenge of the earth. It is... 100 nanometers of hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, proteins, and nucleic acids, end quote. Detecting any surplus meaning beyond this elemental material breakdown is pure fanatical illusion. A clever contributor to Magnificat, commenting this month on the Lord's angry assault of the Amorite army by a thunderstorm of giant hail in Joshua 10, remarks that the conceptual distance between the world of the Bible and our own meteorological vision is captured in the distance separating weathermen from weather gods. Imagine the Sumerian Ishkur wearing a green sport coat predicting a high pressure system. Something similar goes for punitive plagues. In fact, the word plague itself is actually a proper name in the Hebrew Bible, Refesh, an ancient West Semitic god equated interestingly with Apollo. He appears in the retinue of Elohim himself in the archaic hymn of Habakkuk 3. God came forth from Taman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. Before him went pestilence, Deber, also a god, and plague, Refesh, followed close behind. Was your wrath against the rivers, O Lord, or your anger against the rivers, or your rage against the sea when you drove your horses and your chariots to victory? You brandished your naked bow, sated were the arrows at your command. Max Weber spoke of Entzauberung, the shattering of the world's once magical enchantment. In this case, we might speak still more of an Entengstigung, a loss of fear, uh, a defanging of the divine warrior. For while hysteria manifestly remains, uh, witness the toilet paper apocalypse, both servile and holy fear of God are in deep recession. Our gods are no longer the capricious, vindictive, violent gods of long ago, 
and no longer the Lord of Old Testament times, rumbling through the clouds, shooting arrows from his chariot of war. Without observing it, we have become a sort of modern Martianite. The error of Martian is a much more pernicious, persistent, and interesting heresy than we tend to suppose. It is not simply a question of books in the canon. It is about the shape and permanence of God's self-disclosure and our resulting image, or better, resulting knowledge of him. We would thus be quite negligent to reckon it as a theological freak show rather than as theological signs of the times when the last years have witnessed a neo-Martianite flare-up around the theologian Notko Schlenke in Berlin. Of course, cleaving the two testaments at this tender point of punition will not do at all. The New Testament itself prohibits any such schizophrenic theological blunder. Speaking to the Corinthians to rectify their dangerous Eucharistic praxis, admitting sexual deviance to communion and creating discontent and factions in the community, and so on, Paul directly appeals to the plagues of the Old Testament God, then gladly uh, adopts the equation and applies it to the case at hand. These things occurred as examples for us, so we must not indulge in sex sexual immorality as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did, and were destroyed by serpents, and do not grumble as some of them did, and were destroyed by the destroyer. No testing has overtaken you that is not common to everyone. All who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. And there you have it. Some Christians are falling, like Israel in the desert, because like Israel in the desert, some Christians have grievously sinned. So we must, it seems, be resolute and prepared to lose the New Testament too, or at least whatever in it seems outmoded, too outmoded for enlightened modern man, if we would be rid of the overly irritable Old Testament God. This is the demythologizing pill that various Protestant religions of spiritual progress have seen fit to swallow. I want to insert here very carefully a brief but quite important clarification. Theologically, and as a matter of responsible exegesis, it should be said that both the questions and the stakes are very different when it comes to the historicity of the Old and the New Testaments, respectively. Just as good Catholic exegetes in our own day have been understandably glad to argue that the ban in Joshua is a literary device, rather than the record of an historical genocide commanded by God, so we might find freedom in taking some literary distance from the pattern of God's repeated massacres in the desert. Paul, of course, took it all with deadly earnest. To this degree, we confront an assumption that we might wish to think through, yet an assertion that we cannot mistake or deny. Paul is telling us that God has not changed his ways. He deals with sin as he always has. Now, before we get too carried away with our new historical critical freedom, I want to bring forward one special case where even historical skeptics are forced to conceive that something extraordinary evidently transpired. In 701 BC, the Assyrian general Sennacherib invaded the Levant, destroying town after town until he came to Jerusalem and besieged it. We have archeological evidence of his path of destruction from vanquished cities like Lachish and his own annals famously boast of his victories, one after another. Then they add, quote, Hezekiah like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem. The failure to recount anything more than a siege points to the rest of the story. For 2 Kings 18 to 19 adds what the propagandistic Assyrian sources fail to say. The destroying angel of the Lord came in the night and 185,000 Assyrian soldiers were slaughtered in front of Jerusalem's gates. This would already be interesting enough, but the Greek historian Herodotus also adds one more detail. He informs us that the Assyrian operation was a failure due to field mice, hinting that disease like the septicemic plague might well have struck. Lord Byron has a short ballad on the scene of Sennacherib that is well worth reading. More theologically interesting, if less poetically lovely, is C.S. Lewis over in jammed sonnet on Sennacherib. The Bible, says Sennacherib's campaign was foiled by an angel. In Herodotus, it says, by mice. Innumerably nibbling, nibbling all one night, they toiled to eat away his bowstrings as warm wind uh, eats ice. 
but muscular archangels, I suggest, employed seven little jaws to labor at each slender string, and by the aid, weak masters though they be, destroyed the smiling lipped Assyrian, cruel bearded king. No stranger that omnipotence should choose to need small helps than great. No stranger if his action lingers till men have prayed and suffers our weak prayers indeed to move as his very muscles in his delaying fingers. Who in his longanimity and love for our small dignities enfeebles for a time his power. So all sides are agreed that Jerusalem was somehow remarkably delivered and spared. But is God himself the deus in this deus ex machina story? Lewis tells us, quite rightly, I think, that we need not simply choose between Herodotus and the Bible. What is the difference in the end between God's using angels or rodents, or indeed using both, plus Israel's prayers, as his instrumental causes in putting his enemies to flight? Paragraph 303 of the Catechism professes our simple conviction. The witness of Scripture is unanimous that the solicitude of divine providence is concrete and immediate. God cares for all, from the least things to the great events of the world and its history. The sacred books powerfully affirm God's absolute sovereignty over the course of events. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. Belief in divine providence is not a purely faith-based proposition, as is well worth adding. Aristotle discusses providence in multiple places, and one might add Thucydides as well patron saint of secular history writing. His famous account of the Athenian plague, known for its accurate medical descriptions and careful reasoning about the origins of the outbreak, it seemed, he says, to have been carried by sailor, sailors from Ethiopia and Egypt, subtly suggests the plague might actually be the work of our old friend Apollo. In fulfillment of an oracle, the god targeted Athens in order to tip the balance of the Peloponnesian War. Both natural and supernatural causes were evidently entertainable, even for an enlightened Greek mind. Israel's biblical history writers, of course, have no similar interest whatsoever in proto-virology, but neither do they in the slightest way deny the medical writers their fun. As always, the Bible's entire concern is simply to shout what an analyst like Thucydides can at best only weakly whisper. Yes, God is acting. Judah's God of war, the Lord of hosts, with Refish at his command, is no less ready than Apollo to intervene in battle. This is why modern exegetes' parlor games of paleopathology applied to the biblical plagues inevitably distracts from the critical point. What really is the septemic plague? The living Lord's action in history, the Bible is burning to cry, is a thousand times more important than field mice and the bulbous proteins that work his purposes. Refish, I have said, is the name for plague, but there's also another revealing word in Hebrew, nega. The base root nun gimel ein means quite simply to touch. A plague is thus a matter of being touched, which resonates at this moment, just as our word contagion is from Latin contangere, to be touched with. The fact of being touched, of course, immediately raises the more important question, touched by what or by whom? My sometime breakfast companion, President Emmanuel Macron of France, said that the coronavirus has no passport. French commentators immediately observed that while the virus may not, the people who carry it most certainly do. In any epidemic, multiple stacked up actors might easily touch us all at once, and our vision is too narrow until we can see every finger moving every piece upon the board. In the story of the final plague of Egypt, modern exegetes have noted three different enumerated agents. Sometimes the text says that a plague will kill the firstborn. Sometimes it is the destroying angel, and sometimes the Lord. These scholars detect a diachronic palimpsest of diverse redactional sources. You might equally see a synchronic cooperation of multiple agents. This theological claim, with its ranking of primary and secondary movers, and its implicit preference for the soul over the body, is the phony scandal that for some would make the Bible hostile to science, as though we should right now somehow find an urgent need for prayer incompatible with cautious confinement and walk around sanctimoniously sneezing and grabbing at every doorknob. The Hebrews, too, were commanded to stay within their houses, praying as the angel of death passed by. And like them, our domestic ritual and prayers should respond to death's chilling visitation, 
we should have in our sights and as the object of our prayers a much greater freedom from a much greater foe than a tiny coronavirus. In the apocryphal life of Adam and Eve, the aged father of the human race does not die peacefully in his bed. He is, in fact, patient zero, to borrow the jargon of the field. He is stricken by a novel sickness new to the world, made of 70 bodily afflictions, a symbol uh, in the apocalypse for the recapitulation of all illnesses, and his body is racked with pain in every member. His sons then come to him and ask him, trembling, what is illness? What is death? It comes, he says, from touching the forbidden fruit. Through Adam's touch, moreover, they too have been infected. They too will know not just life, but death, he says. Through them and through their children, the entire family of Adam has all been touched with the contagion. This Ur illness is the mother of all plagues. Left to itself, if we do not flatten the curve, but let incidents of transgression increase and allow sin to fester in ever new mutations, Adam's story leads to the desert generation. After repeated bouts of sin cum plague without showing the fruits of repentance, God finally swears in his anger that Israel shall not enter into his rest. So the whole lot of them falls dead, wandering aimlessly in the desert. Note that this tragic version of the story has a lot of cumulative subplots, in each of which the plague is for one reason or another mercifully ended. It could be stopped by Phineas, but zealously skewering a pear, coupling in flagrante delicto, or it could be Moses falling on his face in prayer. But the final wanted conversion never comes. Yet we also observe that individual plagues, these avatars uh, of absolute death, always stop short of complete extinction. The piling up of plagues is a response to repeated concrete sins but it is no less a piling up of divine mercy. Namely, in the end, the wicked generation does not die because of one final big old honkin' Godzilla-sized Sharknado plague. They die instead of hard-heartedness, a pharaonic disease. They die because each time that God brought them to the very brink, the very brink of extinction, they resisted and missed the hour of their visitation. And so, like the wicked in the psalm, they fade away. There's also another possible resolution, however. The Ur plague of Adam might also be stanched in its spread and stopped in its tracks. This is the Christological shape of the story of David's plague, which is miraculously halted at the hyper-meaningful site of the altar in the future temple. David guessed right that God is merciful. He, more, he is more merciful than it seems when we consider how much more is in view than simply a single passing plague. When David sins with his census, for which he gets the already merciful Dr. No-like treatment of choosing his torture, we actually have an image of original sin in two different ways. First, as David himself says, the whole people is suffering for the sins of one man. When David saw the angel who was destroying the people, he said to the Lord, I alone have sinned, and I alone have done wickedly, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. This is a remarkable typological image at once of Adam's guilt and of the second Adam's redemption, Christ's readiness to bear the punishment of all upon himself. For even in this concrete story of David, it is in fact in some way not really David's sin at all, but the true punishment merited rather by all. Indeed, all the wheel spinning about what exactly constitutes the sin in taking the census is off the point. For in a most unsettling phrase, in a most unsettling verse, the story begins not only with David himself being prompted by God to commit the wrong, for which all his kingdom is terribly punished, begins before that with God in a prior state of anger against the people. The anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he incited David against them, saying, Go, count the people of Israel and Judah. God is already angry with Israel, and no explanation is given anywhere in the narrative for this pre-existing condition of divine wrath. No specific sin of Israel is ever recounted. It is an image of a kind of primordial wrath, reaching back beyond our sight 
and like concupiscence or the accumulation of habitual sin, it incites further sin, in this case David's, by which the many are destined for punishment, 70,000 in two days, ranging from Dan to Beersheba. The parallel version in 1 Chronicles 21 is obviously uncomfortable with God's dark agency here, and accordingly changes the text to read like this, Satan stood up against Israel and incited David to count the people. As with the death of the firstborn, we have again multiple agents affecting the same dark deed. But for our better comprehension of all the powers at play, the chronicler pulls back the curtain and we recognize the ancient serpent who worked maliciously on Adam in the garden. St. Thomas Summa Contra Gentiles is one quarter devoted to God's providence. And in book three, chapter 17, while showing how all things have God as their final end, Thomas says this, order among ends is a consequence of order among agents. For just as the supreme agent moves all secondary agents, so must all the ends of secondary agents be ordered to the end of the supreme agent, since whatever the supreme agent does, he does for the sake of his end. God is the supreme agent, ordering all from the least things, if only 100 nanometers big, to the great events of world history, like unprecedented global sandstills. He's also the Lord of every principality and power. The ultimate question then is simply, what is God's end? Knowledge of God's own goodness, which is identical with his own life, is his eternally and infinitely will to tell us. It follows that from field mice to the fall of great armies, the happy end of the plague story recounted in 2 Kings is precisely the good end prayed for by Hezekiah. Now, O Lord, our God, save us, I pray, from the king of Assyria's hand, so that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you, O Lord, are God alone. Knowledge of God is the final why ultimately at work here. What was moving to be a tragedy, Jerusalem hemmed in and trapped like a bird in a cage, at the last moment takes a happy, glorious turn. Tolkien's term, you catastrophe, describes well Judah's sudden escape from impending doom and destruction. I only add to this unexpected, happy, and hopeful end the wonderful final twist in the agent that God uses to save his people. He destroys the sword by means of the plague, wielding against our little man my death, the army of Assyria, that deeper death that comes from his hand alone. God turns death against death itself to utterly consume it. It is a strategy that he will use again. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Father Anthony. That's a marvelous talk. And now I'm uh, delighted that we're going to be able to uh, bring in some of our questions. So uh, I uh, see from our um, Zoom feed that we've got some students with uh, questions queued up. So let's go first to Alex Jacobs, who's our chapter president at uh, Trinity University in San Antonio. So Alex, you're up. Father, thank you very much. That was beautiful. Uh, my question is, can you speak on any ways that God's providence was evident in past post-biblical um, plagues? Can I, can I speak on any ways that God's providence was evident in past plagues like after Christ? Did you catch that question? Can you speak on plagues after Christ? Ah, okay, so like the Antonine Plague or um, the, the, the Black Death or something like this. Uh, there's, um, uh, what to say, I, this, this pre-modern um, assumption is a humanistic assumption. It's not a perverse um, invention of the Bible, the, the connection between sin and plague. Um, it goes all the way back. In fact, I'd give another lecture if I had the time on my reading of the Iliad, which I think is a giant uh, poem about a plague. The first scene is actually a plague, and, uh, and the first thing Achilles does is recognize the wrath of Apollo, which comes back in the end. The whole thing is a poem about death seen as a plague. The Greeks are onto this uh, very early on, uh, which is uh, just to take a little heat off of the Bible. Um, everyone experiences divine wrath in this, um, and this, this continues uh, across cultures uh, and down through time. Um, so it's very, very odd um, that uh, since Camus um, uh, or since uh, the last cholera epidemic, um, we've, we've stopped responding uh, in the way we have. I mean, even, even um, defeat in war uh, used to be uh, 
responded to um, as the wrath of God. I, I live next to a building in Jerusalem that was built by the, uh, by the French after they lost the Franco-Prussian War because they assumed God was angry at them. Um, it's, uh, so this, this, this is um, a moment for repentance and sacrifice uh, in every context. Um, it's uh, a moment uh, also uh, for the martyrs of Christian charity. The, the um, Alexandrian plague uh, in the fourth century um, actually puts uh, the first uh, martyrs of charity um, in the martyrology, um, those who go out um, and minister to, uh, to, to the dying uh, at the risk of their very lives are honored like martyrs. This is magnificent. Um, and this is why our life sometimes seems a little boring, um, apocalyptic um, in two, you know, two generations past the, uh, the atomic age is basically a bad choice between Mad Max and Al Gore. And um, it's a lot more interesting uh, if we, like these saints of old, could uh, run out. Saints always seem to be dying in plagues. It seems like it's, it's a good opportunity for us to have a plague uh, every once in a while in our lives. Well, thanks very much. And now we have, a, uh, we have another question. So we're going to Hope Keen, who is a Princeton grad. Hope, it's great to see you on the call here. So please go ahead. Uh, hi, thank you so much, Father. That was a beautiful talk. Um, so I'm really curious about this uh, dichotomy between, I think, what you called the older notion of an enchanted world um, and the seemingly newer notion that we have um, where we've, we've done away with that. Um, and I guess I'm, I'm curious about how that's bad, but also how it could be um, an effect of this notion that we're safe because we have the protection of Christ. And so the things that scared pre-modern or pre-Christ um, people really shouldn't scare us as much because we have the most powerful supernatural force on our side. Um, and so that's always very interesting to me because there seems to be a, a sort of counter movement to like reclaim the enchanted world, but there's a sense in which um, we need not perhaps. Um, yeah, I just wonder what you think about that. Thank you. That's a very good question. There's a lot of dimensions to that. Um, I think in a lot of ways, this this notion of the disenchanted world um, is what I averted to at the beginning, this this neo-Darwinian uh, materialism that, um, that doesn't allow us um, to access any meaning. Um, this, this is obviously uh, immensely disruptive, and without going too postmodern uh, on us, the, the embedding uh, of our lives within a story um, is how we construct meaning uh, in a moment. Um, and so the embedding of our lives in a story of Christ uh, is, is evidently, um, the, the, on the one hand, the way we escape from this disenchanted um, absurdity, and at the same time, uh, a way that um, we gain this, this confidence that's not a world uh, overrun by demons. I mean, the, the, the Lord comes and drives out these demons. Um, it's uh, nevertheless, um, I mean, I, I said Entsauberung uh, and also Entangstigung, um, this, this loss of fear, there's, there's a dimension to Christ um, that should also um, elicit in us um, a virtue of holy fear because he is also the one who comes as judge. I, I don't have the time to talk about him coming with a sword in his mouth. Um, he's actually the final writer in the scene. Um, it's, it's remarkable, actually. The, the most sustained uh, reflection on plagues is in the, the latter half of the Book of Wisdom. Um, and there we have this, this text that shows up in the Christmas readings where um, the, the word springs out in the midst of the night. It's the Logos, um, and that Logos is the destroying angel. Um, uh, we have actually this notion, and it's a theme that could be developed, but where Christ himself, um, as this divine warrior, um, has a frightening aspect. Um, so I, I guess I'd say, yes, we, we want to embed ourselves in a story in which there is a final word of hope, but the, the, the implicit point here in talking uh, about plagues and where they're plotted in the story is that we're plotted in the middle of a story. We're plotted at this, this critical moment, um, this plot complication, where the relationship between 
humanity, me, and God is somehow in question. That's what death means. It, 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 it raises this question. Um, and when it's standing, question can go in two ways. Um, and to, to understand that it's not decided in advance, this is this kind of false eschatology of hope, which thinks we can do it. Um, and that's all there is to it. Um, and so I'd, I'd say that um, this is the, the, the beautiful shape of Christian hope, um, you know, perfect hope, which um, puts us in, uh, you know, a state of serenity um, before the uncertainty uh, of what it means um, to, to stand before the judge. So it's, it's good that we know uh, the one who will be our judge, but it's also in some ways a lot more difficult. I mean, um, I like uh, confessing my sins to anonymous priests behind a screen uh, and not to the people uh, that I offended. Um, so um, there's, there's a, I guess, a painful uh, dimension uh, to, to our purification that it's important to recognize. Well, now we're going to have a question from Daniel Tucker, who's a graduate student in music at Yale. So, Daniel, please go ahead. Thank you for your talk, Father. I'm wondering what insights can be drawn from Scripture about how to suffer well or how to suffer uh, with a sense of trust still in the Lord in times like this. Yeah, the, the, the Psalms would be another thing that I, I certainly didn't, didn't talk about, but um, if... If there's a critical invitation, I, I, I in passing said we, we have this remarkable moment of the of, of Passover. Okay, we're about to celebrate this mystery, and it's it's a, a moment in which Israel is told to um, to shut their doors uh, and to go home and to pray um, in in hope, um, um, confidence that this blood smeared um, of the Paschal Lamb will protect us um, from the pest outside. Um, this, this confidence in the blood, um, which is the blood of Christ, is, is something that gives us confidence, um, not just against the coronavirus. I mean, I think it's, it's important that in a way we also, also look ahead a little bit to this, this nice Christian tradition um, of the Rhesus Pascale, kind of laughing uh, at death and, and its avatars, which is why think we could and should make fun of the coronavirus just a little bit. I mean, it's, it's this tiny thing which, on the one hand, shows, as Lewis said, the, the immensity of God's power. Um, they can do this uh, with a speck of dust. Um, uh, on the other hand, it shows just that, the immensity of God's power. How, how, how big is God? How strong is God? How able is he to do all things? To, to, to me, the most important thing is that in this moment, we don't we don't lose sight of, um, uh, of this fantastic invitation. It, everything's in providence, and it's providence that this happens in Lent. The entire world is invited into the desert. And we know the story. We know how it goes. You can fall in the desert, um, or we can, we can be with that remnant uh, that follows Joshua, who is the true Jesus, uh, into the promised land. So... What I didn't touch on here, and it's it's um, it's a major major theme, is the way that inside a play, God God has smart bombs, and He also sometimes goes carpet bombing. Okay, so the destroyer, um, this mashhit, um, Saint Paul said um, they're destroyed by the destroyer. This only appears two times um, in in Exodus twelve uh, and in this passage in First Corinthians. Um, the destroyer um, in the Makilta uh, de Rabbi Ishmael, this rabbinic text, um, is the one who is who goes berserk in the old Nordic sense, um, and he just kills left and right without discrimination. That is both uh, the the guilty and the just. Um, but there's also a way um, in which even and this is this is why um, some of these documents say this is obviously not uh, punition because it's not just the guilty who are falling. Okay, we could we could talk about this too. The guilty, in um, uh, the, the the way that the um, the guilty and the innocent um, are targeted. God God though targets even in the interior um, of this reckless, uh, indiscriminate act of the um, uh, of the destroyer, his people in a very special way. So it's it's um, in fact uh, it's aimed at all of the firstborn. The first plagues are just aimed at the Egyptians, but the, the, the last plague is aimed 
at all the firstborn, even of the animals. Um, and this actually targets Israel more than anyone, because uh, in chapter 4 of Exodus, God says, Israel is my firstborn. Israel, actually, is, is the one that stands most in the crosshairs. And precisely as uh, God's uh, firstborn, the one um, that uh, is, is most in danger, they're the ones who receive the sign of protection. Um, and this is, this is that uh, double meaning of this word that springs forth, that the double-edged sword um, of this destroying angel, the Logos, um, is destruction for the one, but, uh, but redemption for the others. Um, so we have, we have confidence in the power of the one who has the power to destroy our enemy. I mean, that's, that's the, the whole story, which is just an incredible miracle. I mean, um, with, with evidence um, in the annals of Assyria that, that God has the power to, to wipe out in a night um, um, an army ranged against us. Um, and the army is just an image uh, of every threat. So, you know, if God has that kind of power and can do it with... Uh, with a little piece of dust, what can he do uh, with his strong right arm? Well, we have time for just a few more questions. We've got about uh, seven minutes to go here. And uh, I think our next up uh, questioner is uh, Christopher Tomaszewski, who's the president of our Baylor chapter, a philosopher and graduate student. So Christopher, please go ahead. Hello, Father. Thank you for your talk. I really enjoyed it. Um, so this is connected, I think, with the end of your previous question, um, which is, I was hoping you could say a little more on how we reconcile the fact that God uses plagues as punishments with the fact that uh, plagues are a very indiscriminate means of destruction uh, that do not um, uh, distinguish between the guilty and the innocent. Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you. Good question. I mean, that's where I, I, I brought in this nice uh, um, Life of Adam and Eve text, which sees the sees original sin as a giant plague, um, the, the introduction of illness in its comprehensive form. The, the, the mother of all plagues um, is death um, as the wages of sin. Um, so, so in this way, at a very basic level, there's, there's a low-grade punishment. I mean, th who's innocent? Um, who's, who's innocent. There's the innocent, the guilty, um, in a kind of relative sense. Um, and this is why, I mean, the much more serious thing um, is this, this salvation, this, this defense uh, against death itself. We're not just praying for protection against the coronavirus, we're praying for protection against death, um, it, it, eternal death. Um, so uh, the... The, the, the fact that sometimes we see, see, we have different kinds of patterns. Um, sometimes I sin and there's immediately a plague, okay? And you can't miss the connection, okay? I was just fornicating with a Midianite and now everyone's dying. And so we need to, you know, impale the guy with a pole. Um, that, that you can't miss. And in fact, this is a difference between the, the biblical and the Greek way of looking at it. The Greeks... Um, don't always know what, what they did wrong. Um, so that's actually what Achilles has to do at the beginning of the Iliad. It's like, you know, there's a plague, so obviously we sinned. Go get a seer, figure out what, what's, you know, irritating Apollo. Um, that never happens in the biblical text. It's always manifest the sins because they cry to the heavens, okay? And so we have this, this pattern of sometimes the, the, the conjunction is so strong that it can't be missed. But you also have low-grade punishments, okay, um, that, that don't target, okay, they did this, now they get hit, um, but, but target um, a different kind of collective sin. So we need to think about actual, uh, individual, collective, and original sin as different categories because there's also plagues that respond in a cumulative way, slowly. I mean, in fact, God, um, Amos 4 is a good uh, case of this, where um, there's no sins um, specifically, um, but just generic, you guys, um, for a long, long time, a generation now, uh, haven't been returning to me, okay? So, in a way, okay, some people have said this, this plague um, can't, you know, right now, this pandemic doesn't correspond, like, what do we do this week? Like, why, why now? Um, and here the time gap uh, is important to bear in mind. Adam dies um, at a ripe 930 years old uh, of a sin he committed in his sprightly youth. 
Okay, there's there's a gap between this and in wisdom, there's a, a proportion. This is this is how the the ten plagues are understood. There's a proportion between um, contrapasso, Dante as contrapasso, between everything that the um, the Egyptians receive and what they've done. So the death of the firstborn is punishment for throwing the the children um, in the river. Now that's something they did 80 years before, okay? Because we know the age of Moses. So the, the, part part of this is is a little bit hidden in God's wisdom. Is where where are the sins, the cultural sins, uh, or the ur sin, the original sin? What, the, to back to the to to the statement. Um, uh, you know, sickness is not punishment for sin. Sickness is punishment for sin. Death is punishment for sin. That's why it's in the world. Um, and um, it can be the, the result of original sin, of, uh, of collective sin, of individual and actual sin. And there's different ways that all those things um, can and sometimes are punished. Okay, I think we have time for just one more question. And that will be from Ben Becker who is the co-president of our chapter at Hillsdale. So Ben, please go ahead. Hi, Father. Thanks for your talk. Um, I guess one thing I was wondering is how do we present um, this kind of biblical wisdom in an age that um, I think sees a lot of times like the book of, you know, the Bible and then the book of science as kind of these two um, kind of very different kind of competitive um, um, kind of areas of wisdom and like how, how do we how do we present this kind of uh, vision that you have in this age? Yeah, thank you. That's a good question. I mean, the big response I tried to give is this this notion of of instrumental causality, uh, secondary agents. I mean, if we want to to think in in, in Thomistic terms of a of, of a way to understand this 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 kind of nesting. Um, of uh, instrumental agents, and and we see this in the Bible um, in in particular ways. Like I said, I mean it's it's interesting how um, there there are indications even in this this language of touching that I mean they they understood how an epidemic spreads. You know you don't you don't pass this on, and so actually we have quarantining in certain cases actually in the Levitical code. So I mean there's there's a kind of scientific awareness. Um, the, I think an important thing to understand is that if the Bible doesn't talk in medical terms, it's not, or, or scientific terms, it's not because anything it says is, is in any way problematic. It's because it's putting the emphasis in another place. Um, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Catholics are lucky uh, to, to, to have all of the scriptures because in the deuterocanonical books, these Hellenistic books, these books that are written, um, and infused with the Greek spirit of wisdom, we actually have a resonance uh, of the beginnings of, uh, of Greek medical know-how. So actually in the, in the Book of Wisdom as, as well, we have a kind of proto-pharmacological um, laudatio, okay? God, God hasn't uh, committed any deadly drugs, okay? There's, there's this knowledge of pharmaceuticals and so forth that's, that's standing behind this. There, and there it is in the inspired text. Uh, we're, we're not against this. As I said, though, um, to, to, to assert God is at work in history, he's at work right now, um, this isn't just a, a nonsense thing that happens, demands that we escape from this, not just, um, you know, the kind of Charles Taylor uh, imminent uh, frame, uh, but this fantastically narrow materialism. I mean, this this quote, the, the, it's not the, the wrath of God, it's, you know, it's this... Um, Hundred nanometer um, collection of uh, of hydrogen and proteins. I mean, if that's all we can see, if that's all we want to see, um, then we've missed the entire picture. And you know, the Bible is is shouting in a strong way that there's also something else. Um, so I mean, there's there's lots of dimensions to the science and faith question. Um, it's phony, um, as uh, as I suggested there, um, and in in some ways, I mean the. Um, the, the, the point here is that um, we're not presenting uh, an alternative etiology, just as we're not with creation. I mean, it's it, it's exactly um, parallel case. That's why I mentioned neo-Darwinians. Um, to say that God created the world, even as the Bible said, um, doesn't mean that he can't use the instrumental uh, causes that we know by science. So I think that's, that's the way to come at it um, in any case. Um, so I hope that helps.
Well, uh, let me give uh, the thanks on behalf of everyone who's watching from home and on behalf of uh, the Thomistic Institute to Father Anthony for a marvelous talk and uh, for being so generous with his time to give us. Uh, I mean, he, he knew, he, he, I know that he worked very hard to prepare something on very short notice for all of you. Um, of course, uh, now that we're all quarantined here at the Dominican House of Studies, we're thinking about these subjects and uh, he's given us a lot to reflect on. Let me give you just a few final announcements before we uh, conclude our broadcast. Thanks very much for watching. Uh, please do um, sign up for the quarantine lecture series at ThomisticInstitute.org. And if you do that, then you'll get notices about the upcoming events, and you'll also get a uh, login for uh, following this, this ongoing lecture series on Zoom. Of course, you can always find us on uh, YouTube and Facebook. Our next lecture will be Thursday, this Thursday, April 2nd, also at 8 p.m. Eastern, on the presence of God in a season of solitude by Father James Brent. So we're looking forward to having Father Brent here, and I'm sure you'll uh, enjoy his talk. That's one of his favorite subjects. So it's going to be a real treat to hear him. Finally, last announcement, very important, especially for those of you on Zoom. We are going to be starting our discussion groups uh, as soon as this broadcast ends. So you should have already received a link about how to join your Zoom uh, discussion group. So as soon as we're done here, join that discussion group, and then we will uh, allow you to um, go forward and continue the conversation uh, with, uh, with the other people who've been tuning in, especially students uh, with other students. And uh, so thanks very much for joining us from the Thomistic Institute in Washington, D.C. My name is Father Dominic Legg, and we will see you on Thursday.